Today's presentation is using re realistic covariates with the new trial simulator to optimize meropenem dosing in renally impaired children. Our speakers for today are Drs. Mark Laverne and Edward Nitas. Mark is currently a Vice President of Integrated Drug Development at Sertara. He brings more than 15 years of experience in applying modeling and simulation tools and techniques towards optimally informing drug development decision making. Also, we'd like to welcome Dr. Edward Nitas, where he is currently a pediatric nephrologist in the Division of Nephrology at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. He's also an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati in the Department of Pediatrics. Mark and Eddie, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to Eddie to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone today. So I will be talking about um, using the clinical trial simulator to model pharmacokinetic uh, drug dosing in children who are receiving renal replacement therapy. So I'll briefly just give a background of the clinical um, scenario in that this uh, problem presents and then talk about some of the challenges in dosing meropenem in children who have kidney injury and receive renal replacement therapy. And then I'll, I'll show how we use the clinical trial simulator to model the pharmacokinetics of, of this population of children receiving meropenem. So just for an introduction, sepsis is a prevalent cause of acute kidney injury in children, and this may require the need for continuous renal replacement therapy which can be thought of as just a continuous form of dialysis for those who aren't uh, familiar with this. The outcomes in this population, so critically ill children who are receiving CRT are poor with mortality rates exceeding 40%, and inadequate treatment with antibiotic therapy is predictive of patient mortality. So it's very important to adequately dose uh, important, potentially life-saving antibiotics in this population. And meropenem is one of these such antibiotics that is frequently prescribed for this population, which was why we chose to study it. So a brief review of the pharmacokinetics of meropenem and the properties of meropenem. It is primarily excreted by the kidneys. It, uh, it is a time, it's characterized by time-dependent bactericidal activity so just this, this means that the efficacy of it is determined by the percentage of time during the dosing interval that the concentration of free drug in the serum exceeds the MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentration. And that's just the, the minimum amount of drug necessary to prevent growth uh, on a Petri, Petri dish and it is determined in the, in the microbiology lab from bl blood cultures. So again, it's just deter the efficacy is determined by the percentage of time of the dosing interval that that concentration of meropenem is above the MIC for the organism you're targeting. And the characteristics of meropenem render it significantly re removed by CRRT. It has a small volume of distribution. It does not have uh, much protein binding at all, and it is very small uh, molecular size. So it is efficiently removed by continuous renal replacement therapy. For those that aren't in clinical care, this is just a picture of a CRT machine. So this is the machine that would be hooked up to the patient's bedside, and this is the filter that would be plugged into the machine here. And then a, a patient would typically have a catheter inserted into the in internal jugular vein. Their blood would come through this access line and then circulate through the filter and then return to the patient through this blue return line. I won't go into the details of CRT, but just wanted to give you a picture of what we modeled. I will say that the total dose of CRT is measured by the total affluent, which comes out through this yellow, uh, this yellow line and then collects in this bag. And that's just the total of the dialysate, the total of the replacement fluid, 
and the fluid removed from the patient. So it's the sum of those, and it's often expressed in mLs per hour. So the dose of CRT is expressed as mLs per hour of affluent that is leaving the patient and collecting in this bag. So concerning the pharmacokinetics of any antibiotic in a children who's in a child who's critically ill, this can be a little bit of a, a challenging scenario, and that's due to a few things. First, patients with sepsis can have alterations in their pharmacokinetics compared to healthy children. For example, they can have increased volume of distribution. That can be due to capillary leak associated with the inflammation itself, or it can be due to giving excessive amounts of resuscitative fluids. Also, they can have acute kidney injury, which of course can affect clearance of, of renally cleared drugs. And there's also just inter-individual variation in PK parameters in this population that uh, is often encountered and has been documented, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the next slide. Also, of course, the CRT, the replacement therapy itself, affects drug clearance. It does remove uh, many, many antibiotics, certainly all that are small and of the size of meropenem would be removed. The, my, the main uh, CRT dosing uh, prescription parameter that affects drug clearance, like I said, was the total affluent volume. And as I showed in the slide before, that's just the total, the sum total of the dialysis fluid, replacement fluid, and fluid removal that is then collected in the affluent bag. So that's the main determining factor. But other things may play a role. Uh, so, for example, the mode of CRT, whether you use dialysis or hemofiltration or the filter material, those are thought to play much less of a role. And the primary determining factor is, again, the dose of CRT uh, expressed in terms of mLs per hour of affluent volume. So this paper, it was done in adults, but it did adequately describe the problem that we face, and that is not dosing these potentially life-saving medicines adequately. And this paper looked at four commonly prescribed antibiotics, meropenem, this one was uh, Zosin or Piperacillin, Tazobactam. This was Cefepime, and this was Ceftazidine. And I just wanted, they, they measured the target attainment of these drugs in this patient population, with the exception, like I said, they were adults. And you can see that Meropenem, they did attain target attainment 81% of the time, and these were standard dosing regimens that were used, which was not bad. But for the other drugs, uh, for example, Zosin, only 66% of the time was target attainment reached, or I'm sorry, 71%, um, these numbers are the target attainment in the first 48 hours, which was even less. 0% uh, of the patients receiving cefepime received, uh, achieved target attainment, and only 53% uh, of the patients receiving ceftazidime. So it is, it is a problem to adequately dose antibiotics in this, in this you know, very vulnerable population with, with poor outcomes. There have been several studies that have looked at meropenem dosing in adults receiving CRT. Again, this is adults. And this slide summarizes these studies. You can see they did vary in the mode of CRT, and that's, this is just whether it was purely hemofiltration or hemodialysis. There's a, a, a difference. I won't go into the details. But they did differ in the mode, but they also differed, importantly, in the affluent rate, which, again, as I said earlier, is the main determining factor of drug clearance in patients receiving uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. And you can see that as each study had higher affluent rates prescribed, not surprisingly, the CRT clearance of meropenem increased. And that would be expected. And, and this, of course, contributed to increasing total clearance, uh, accounting for both the endogenous and the extracorporeal clearance. And based on those results, you can see that very different dosing regimens were suggested, ranging anywhere from 500 milligrams every 12 hours to a gram every eight hours. So these, the, the summary of these studies is that CRT dosing and prescription differences can affect the pharmacokinetics and then can affect what can determine and, and influence what an appropriate dose would be to give to these patients. Apart from CRT influencing drug disposition, also 
as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of inter-individual inter changes or variation in PK parameters. And this was demonstrated in a, a fairly recent study that looked again at many commonly prescribed antibi antibiotics in patients receiving CRRT. And what they found is that the coefficient of variation or the, you know, the between subjects variability ranged in, both in terms of clearance and volume of distribution uh, approached 30 to 50 percent for most drugs. So that's a very wide variability in these, in, of course, in these key pharmacokinetic parameters. And this resulted in a wide distribution of concentration time profiles. So when they modeled the uh, two different dosing regimens of meropenem, 500 Q12 and a gram Q12, you can see that these, uh, the range of these distribution uh, concentration time profiles almost overlap due to the differences in PK parameters. So that's another problem that can uh, cause or make render effective dosing uh, a little difficult. In children, and as, uh, as I mentioned, most, all the studies I have mentioned up till now were in adults, there's even less data. And I just did a quick PubMed search plugging in the word CRT pediatrics and antibiotics, so this wasn't even specific to meropenem, any antibiotic, and only three hits came up. Two were, that, were studies that I had participated in, and then this study, I don't know why it came up, but it uh, did involve adult patients. So really, there's not much data out here in terms of dosing of any, any antibiotic in children receiving CRRT. So that led us to the study that I'll talk about, and this is where we uh, were able to collaborate and use this clinical trial simulator to um, model the pharmacokinetics of meropenem in children receiving CRRT. So our objective was to evaluate the target attainment of standard dosing regimen in this population. And to accomplish this, we, we did two things, really. First of all, we used the cl clinical trial simulator and we incorporated PK parameters from adult data that were allometrically scaled to pediatric patients. And then, secondly, we had a real database of 287 patients who were children and young adults up to 22 years of age who received CRT at 13 pediatric centers in the United States. So we had data, real data from these patients, their weight, the CRT prescription, the affluent rate, et cetera, and we could use these real covariates and incorporate them into the model to produce, you know, very um, realistic uh, PK distribution curves of meropenem. For our study, target attainment was defined using two breakpoints of 40% and 75% of the dosing interval. And our MIC was four micrograms per L, which is the meropenem susceptibility breakpoint for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a very common MIC used in, in many other studies when evaluating target attainment in meropenem. So looking at the basic characteristics of this cohort, again, this is the prospective pediatric continuous renal replacement therapy cohort, you can see that uh, there was, each age group was fairly well represented, a little bit smaller patients in the over 18 years of age, but uh, a good distribution across uh, the childhood, you know, range of ages. And I won't go through all the, the demographic variables, but I did want to point out one, one key thing, and that is you can see that the total affluent rate prescribed expressed on a per kilo basis <clears throat> varied significantly as you went from the younger children, children to the older uh, children and young adults. And of course, this is important because this will affect drug distribution and affect drug clearance. You can see that the younger than one age group received over 100 mLs per kilo per hour of dialysis dose, you can think of this as. And then this progressively decreased so that the, the young adults, the children over, uh, you know, the, the, ch the patients over 18 years of age, only received 24 mLs per kilo per hour. And that's 
fairly common, and this is one reason for this is that children on a per kilo basis receive a lot more IV fluids and, and blood products, and so then removing those or removing that volume with CRT increases the total clearance. So that's not surprising. And uh, the affluent rate was also higher expressed normalized per, per body surface area, as you can see. So this is a, a summary of the model that we constructed. And you can see that it's divided into two parts. The first part is the patient part of the model, and that has the traditional pharmacokinetic parameters in it of the volume of the central compartment, and the clearance, K12 and K21. And then this is the CRT part of the model, and it has a few volumes which represent the inside of the filter where the blood would pass and then the volume of the cartridge. Those were obtained from the manufacturer. Uh, but we were able to express these pharmacokinetic parameters as a function of those real covariates that we obtained from the database. So, for example, K34 would be a very important parameter representing removal of drug, and that was attained using the affluent rates from the PPCRT database. The standard uh, PK parameters of clearance and volume of distribution were obtained from uh, using constants from adult literature and then allometrically scaling them. And again, the patient weight we would have obtained from the, the PPCRT database, and that's what would have been plugged in for the simulation. So that's a brief overview of the model that was used in the study. And when we conducted the simulations, this, these are the results. And what we found is that in the older children, certainly over the 18, but even older, 12, older than 12, we found that a dosing regimen of 20 per kilo every 12 hours achieved fairly good target attainment. And you can see that the, the mean, uh, or the median, I should say, was, was above the MIC for most of the dosing interval. And, and, and almost all the patients exceeded 40% of the, the dosing interval, which was our, our, one of our markers of target attainment. However, for the younger children, you can see that using the Q12 dosing interval resulted in a significant portion of patients of simulations achieving suboptimal target attainment, and that if you increase the dosing interval to Q8, that this was improved. And this is also summarized in, this, in, these, in these tables. And again, I'll focus on this target attainment which was defined as the concentration of free drug exceeding the MIC for 40% of the dosing interval. Uh, we also used a more strict target attainment of 75% of the dosing interval, but for 40%, you can see that the Q12 dosing regimen in the older children, over 90% of the simulations achieved target attainment. But this dropped in younger children using uh, when, when this dosing regimen was modeled but increasing the frequency of dosing to Q8 then approved, improved target attainment. And similar improvement was seen for the more strict target attainment cutoff of uh, T exceeding the MIC for 75% of the dosing interval. So we concluded that a dosing regimen of 20 milligrams per kilo every 12 hours achieved adequate target attainment for older children, however, Conventional dosing of Q8, and this would be similar to, to what children who don't have kidney injury and aren't receiving renal replacement therapy uh, receive. A conventional dosing of Q8 hours achieved better target attainment for children less than five years. And that was likely due to a few things. First, as I mentioned, the affluent rates or dialysis dose of CRT were higher in the younger children expressed on a per kilo basis. And also, it's, it's well known that there's a non-linear relationship between clearance and size such that clearance normalized to body weight peaks at one year of age and then declines. So increased endogenous clearance when we allometrically scaled those PK parameters in the, in the younger children uh, likely occurred and, and contributed to some extent to the increased clearance and decreased target attainment in, that, in those age groups. We were able to then perform a follow-up study 
where we look to validate the results of these clinical trial simulations. And over a two-year period, we enrolled seven patients at our institution. And I, I want to e express that it was hard to enroll patients. It, we had hoped to get more patients, but it's difficult because these kids are, are ill, they're critically ill, the parents, of course, are, are going through a difficult time. So some of them didn't, didn't want to consent, and that's, that's understandable. Also, they have to be stable enough to draw blood samples for 12 hours. So if they have a clinical problem and need to go down to the CT scanner, then that's going to interrupt your study and you're not, you know, you're not going to be able to get adequate samples to, to conduct the PK analysis. So it's hard to enroll patients. Certainly many more patients than this receive meropenem and CRT, but this is what we were able to successfully enroll and then conduct the study. You can see we still didn't get many patients in the younger age group. Only one was less than 10. But when we conducted the pharmacokinetic analysis of these seven patients, we found results that confirmed that which had been previously published in the adult literature, and that was, first, that there was a, a significant variability in the total clearance, so you can see that the, the mean was, was 74, but the total clearance ranged anywhere from, and this is expressed normalized to body surface area, too, of course, for children you know, ranged from 48 to 152. The clearance from the CRT circuit normalized to body surface area was fairly constant, which is not too surprising since we prescribe a standard dose in, in our patients. But you can see the endogenous clearance, so the renal and non-renal clearance had a wide variability ranging from zero to 120. But when we did the PK analysis, and then we compared that to our trial simulations. It showed that our simulations were, were valid, and this is six of the curves that I just superimposed on what our predictions uh, uh, showed. And you can see that all the curves fall within the distribution, within the distributions that were predicted by the clinical trial simulator based on the model that we had constructed. It did seem, especially in this group, that they tended to be on the, the upper half of the distribution, and I'll talk about why that probably was on the next slide. So, in summary, our results were in agreement, in agreement with our previous in silico, in, silico, in silico clinical trial simulations, which demonstrated that a dose of 20 per kilo every 12 hours provided good target attainment. Um, however, we did observe that the PK curves were above the median in our cohort, and that was likely due to lower endogenous clearance observed in our cohort uh, compared to the predicted endogenous clearance based on the adult data that we used in the simulations. The adult data, the endogenous clearance was about 67 mLs per minute, whereas we found 35 mLs per minute per 1.73 meters squared. So the clearance was a little bit on the lower end of the distribution of, of the, the simulations. Perhaps that was just due to random sampling, and if we enrolled 20 patients, we'd get patients on the other end of the distribution. Or perhaps maybe our model needed to be tweaked, modified, and incorporate a little bit lower endogenous clearance. Also, I'd just point out that we weren't able to enroll patients less than five years in this age group, group as, we, as our simulations demonstrated may need more frequent dosing. So at that point, I'll uh, conclude my end, and I'll turn things over to Mark, who can then uh, showcase the clinical, clinical trial simulator in a little more a little more detail. Great, thank you very much, Eddie. Um, just a moment while I queue up the screen sharing. So. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take a few moments today and explain how uh, the simulation study that Eddie just described was implemented in Trial Simulator. Some of you may be familiar uh, with this simulation platform, which uh, had been offered uh, or released 
going back to the late 90s, I guess, but then um, most recently we're getting ready to re-release it, uh, specifically with uh, a couple of major improvements. Number one, it's going to, it works now with all of the modern 64-bit operating systems, and then also uh, as previously, Trial Simulator used S Plus as an engine for doing uh, inferential analysis and you know, plots, et cetera. Uh, we phased that out, and now it uses R. So, um, and I'll show, illustrate that shortly. What you're seeing here is the main dashboard for Trial Simulator, and generally speaking, if you start at this first icon here and work your way down and over, um, you'll sort of fill out those aspects of the simulation in a logical order uh, that would, you know, generally make sense as you were thinking about a clinical trial simulation. So one of the first things we need to consider, generally speaking, is the trial population. And as Eddie explained, this is a pediatric trial, a pediatric population. And I think also uh, of key importance is that this population has a variety of characteristics uh, that, you know, are maybe not uh, all that typical, particularly in addition to the individual characteristics, there are uh, characteristics with regard to the continuous renal replacement therapy that they received. So when I click the button for covariate distribution, it pulls up this page here, and, and in this I can specify any number of individual characteristics or parameters. Uh, that would be available to the drug model. And um, I have the ability to specify those distributions parametrically, uh, meaning I can specify a normal distribution and there's all sorts of things I can do around having either an independent covariance, covariance structure, which is how it's currently specified, or any number of um, correlations or dependencies. To be honest, I very rarely use the parametric simulation for covariate distributions because, as Eddie pointed out, it's generally better to use real-world data because that preserves the inherent correlations between things like body weight, age, gender, et cetera. So here's where we get into one of the really nice features of trial simulators. You can see down below. Essentially what I'm doing is that I'm importing from a file in which every record in that file, every row, has a full set of the variables that the model expects. So for instance, age, weight, sex, these Q variables are all have to do with the parameters of the continuous renal replacement therapy, including the filter volume and cartridge volume. But this is all subject level data that was collected, um, uh, and then we are able to make use of that in the simulation. So that's a key point uh, for this particular example. So then coming back to the dashboard, we've, we've specified the, the characteristics of our patient population, at least that those characteristics are important as far as the drug and disease model. So now let's talk about the drug and disease model. So this is the um, model specification workbench that Trial Simulator uses. And um, for readability purposes, I've grouped some of the components uh, into two distinct categories. Well, first of all, off to the left are a variety of variables that the model will pull in and use as needed some of which are coming from the literature and some um, are just specified by the user. I've subgrouped those into subgroups so that if I'm trying to debug my model, I understand what, you know, where certain variables are found, such as, uh, you know, central tendencies for, for um, model parameters and then also chemofiltration conditions, et cetera. But everything in this block here is essentially the, the endogenous PK processes. So this would be 
you know, everything include, you know, including the dosing of meropenem into the central compartment via an IV administration. It's a two compartment model um, with between subject variability on all parameters essentially. And then there is um, essentially some, you know, natural elimination of drug. But as we know, uh, these patients are often uh, experiencing uh, renal impairment. And so off to the right here are all of the parameters and processes uh, associated with the continue, continuous renal replacement therapy. Uh, before moving on from the um, model specification, I think it's worth um, showing that trial simulator has this very nice drug model debugger. So for instance, as I'm building my model, if I want to check that I've gotten things right, I can, um, for instance, provide a dose um, into the um, central compartment. Oh, okay, sorry, there we go. I had to put it into a compartment, there we are. So anyway, what you're seeing here are profiles for individual subjects, uh, and they're essentially sampled in real time. I can put uh, just one line on there or up to 50 lines so that I can see what data for a variety, you know, for a variety of subjects, how variable it is and whether or not I'm getting some really strange behaviors that may indicate that I've uh, misspecified something in my model. Okay, so we've now specified our drug and disease model. Um, we've specified our trial population. The next thing we would want to consider are, um, you know, what's our trial design? So in this case, we're, we're really simulating large cohorts of subjects uh, because we want to take and essentially uh, make recommendations for the population as a whole. Uh, if we were really, so in this instance, we're not necessarily evaluating a trial success rate. If we were, we would want to keep the sample size similar to the intended design for the trial, and we could even explore uh, potentially the sensitivity of trial outcome to varying the sample size. But one of the things I really like about Trial Simulator is when you click the, the protocol summary, the interface for specifying the trial design looks very much like a trial outline. So for instance, there is a space, it's all hyperlinked, so basically the space uh, where you can specify objectives or background, you just basically click the link and there's a little dialog box for putting some of that information in. If I want to see at a glance everything that's going on in the trial with regard to dose administration and sampling of endpoints, I can click this study timeline and you can see all the green um, triangles here are administration of drug and you can see our two schedules that Eddie talked about the twice daily and the three times daily here. And then um, down on day seven, I actually take some uh, samples for meropenem concentration. And then this, uh, this FOSC is actually uh, a fluid overload um, variable, which is essentially a lot of, uh, many times in these subjects, they often retain water, uh, which has an impact on their body size, uh, but, and, and therefore we're exploring the potential impact of increasingly severe states of fluid retention. And we're, we're uh, as you'll see, I'll use that to, to explore different outcomes. So, um, in addition to the overall study timeline, we can specify um, our treatment arms. One of the things that's uh, helpful in trial simulator is you can scale 
the amounts administered by a cobra. In this case, uh, we're giving big per kg doses, and um, but we could scale by any number of covariates that are available, or for instance, uh, we, we could, if we want to make a dose adjustment depending on the filtration rate of the, um, or the uh, perfusion rate, if you will, of the renal replacement therapy. In addition to the scaling continuously, we can adjust using a dose adjustment table so that we could say, for instance, above a certain body weight, everybody gets the same dose. Uh, and then we might have other body weight categories that would have fixed doses associated with them as well. And then also um, the ability, trial simulator offers the capability to adjust doses based on uh, responsive values that occur throughout the trial. So for instance, if I was giving a diabetes drug and I wanted to titrate the dose based on fasting plasma glucose, trial simulator can handle that so you can adjust the dose up or down based on um, where you are in your therapeutic window. So there are other bells and whistles here, um, including you can, as far as assigning subjects to treatment arms, you can um, stratify based on both a, um, a covariate, so for instance, we could stratify based on age into certain um, treatment groups. We can, um, we can also uh, build a lead-in phase into our study so that we can, uh, before we really randomize the subjects, we could give a pretreatment, for instance, of a related therapy and see how they respond and then based on that, maybe allocate them differently to treatment arms. Okay, so that's the base design of the trial. Um, other things that we might consider um, include things like, uh, well, we might want to think about, well, what if we don't have a perfectly compliant conduct? So uh, that there is some capability to simulate missed doses, um, in particular, it's um, you can have, for instance, the probability of missing a dose or missing an observation, or we have what's called a two-point model, which means, uh, which is some of, somewhat of a means of simulating things like drug holidays, and, and that once you go non-compliant, there's a different probability of going back into compliance. Um, so that capability exists as well. So um, there also is the ability as part of the simulation uh, to analyze the data from a, simulate, a, a simulated trial. So as I'm sure everyone is aware, you know, typically it's not the raw data that we use to make the decision, but it's some summarization or inferential analysis of the raw data. So here's where the R part comes in is for the, uh, in this particular instance, I have developed an R script that computes the target attainment rates for uh, the, based on the meropenem concentration. So if I want to edit this, you can see basically I've given it a name for the method, which is target attainment rates, and I've said it's a custom R script. There are other analyses that I can use, including just simple descriptive statistics, or you can do an ANOVA or ANCOVA uh, analysis in the native trial simulator environment. If it's anything sort of sophisticated, then, you know, the R script is probably the best way to go. What do I have to do to do that? Well, basically, I have to give it a name for uh, what the, the, essentially the results window that everything's going to be presented in. I have to give it a data frame name. That's the data frame that um, that R will pass back to the trial simulator, and then trial simulator will read that in those results. And then I tell it what variables to pass to R, and I point it to a R script um, that 
trial simulator would win call and run as part of the simulation. So in the interest of time, I've actually run this simulation already. Um, and, oh, sorry, one more thing before I show the results. Uh, you may recall I mentioned that um, we wanted to explore the impact of the fluid retention and the fluid overload. And so this page aesthetically doesn't look like it's all that exciting. But to me, this is one of the most powerful aspects of trial simulator, is that you can specify multiple scenarios, both with regard to your assumptions with respect to the drug and disease model, and also aspects of the trial design. So here we only have one sort of facet, which is the fluid retention. So here we're saying, let's assume a subject is not retaining any extra fluid, and then 10, Percent, the next scenario is 10% of their body mass or the, is additional, an additional 10% is this fluid retention, 20 and 30%. So as we go down the list, the fluid, the fluid retention is becoming increasingly severe. Potentially, I could add a variety of different scenarios, some of which, if you look here on the left, are aspects or assumptions about the drug and disease model. But over here are actually pro like pro properties of the protocol. So for instance, I could change, if I was doing a dose ranging trial, I could change up which doses are considered in the dose ranging. Or I could change the number of subjects included in the trial, as I mentioned before, to see what sort of impact that had on the success rate of the trial. So there's all kinds of things I could do to explore the impact of the features of the trial on the, on the eventual outcome. So, as I said, in the interest of time for this demonstration, I already ran this the, the simulation with these four scenarios for the fluid retention. And essentially, um, you can see here that um, Basically, this is the main database for the simulation. And then when I ran the simulation, I automatically got this target attainment rate, which was created as part of my um, analysis plan that I specified to run as part of the simulation. Uh, so here you can see basically a table, a listing, if you will, for uh, essentially the various scenarios, so we have a scenario where we have the fluid retention at the zero percent, so they're not retaining any fluid. We have a, a row for each age group, but then within each age group we have um, the two treatment schedules, the 12 hour and the eight hour, and then um, the two targets that Eddie mentioned as far as target attainment, the 40% and the 75%. And then here we have at the very right, the percent attainment for subjects in that age group given that treatment for that particular target attainment uh, definition. So it's great that we can run the, um, the uh, analysis plan, but in general that analysis plan is executed within a particular replication. And oftentimes what we will do in trial simulation is we will run many, many copies of the same trial, which is not a luxury we have in real life, because every time you run a trial, it costs buttloads of money. So, um, Instead, here we have the, uh, the, the, the ability to say, okay, if I did have infinite cash and ran the trial many times, what is my estimated probability, or use that as an estimated probability of the successful outcome of the trial? So that's more of a trial meta-analysis in that I'm looking at success rate over many replications of the same design. So we also have the ability to provide for that in that we can analyze right here in the um, trial simulator, we can do essentially using the overall trial 
database. We can do a custom analysis in R. And um, it so happens I've already done that, um, but just to give you a feeling for what, how you would go about doing it, um, in essence, oh, it doesn't want to, okay, let's do this. So basically, again, you sort of say, well, what variables am I going to pass to, um, to R from um, trial simulator? And so you select these from a checklist and you pass them over. And then you point it to the R script that you're going to use to do the analysis. And you give it a data frame that you're going to pass results back. And then essentially you click finish. And then it basically runs R. It takes a few, I mean, that takes a minute or so. So um, I guess I'll just go ahead and do it. Why not? Um, but I'll go ahead while that's running and just show you what the, um, the results look like. I mean, again, there's a tabular listing, but one of the other things I had that this particular script do was um, create some figures, which I'll have to share with you here. Um, maybe I'll unshare trial simulator. So first, before I do that, it has now completed the meta-analysis, and you can see here that, um, you know, it, it created these, um, essentially it, it summarized, again, the data, but now I'm going to, in addition, I, I can create plots on the fly in Toronto Simulator, but I'd far rather just have R create them as part of the R script, and so that's what I've done is um, here, See, where is it? Sorry, I will show you this in just a moment. And can I share this? Oh, I need to do share. I know I need to do. I need to share location photos. There we go. So here's what we're essentially what we're looking at here is a, a plot of the attainment rates for the two targets. Uh, the, the row, the top row is for the every eight hour um, administration for meropenem, and the bottom is every 12 hours. And the columns are the various age categories. So you can see very clearly, as Eddie had illustrated in his talk, that, you know, for ages five and up, we're doing pretty darn good, um, you know, especially for the, uh, you know, the, the PID administration, and especially for the P40 target, uh, and I would even say for the P40 target, the Q12 looks, you know, pretty adequate. Um, but as we get down into the lower age groups, uh, particularly for the Q12 administration, uh, attainment rates are dropping uh, pretty markedly. So. Um, I hope that gives you a feeling for how you would implement um, this type of analysis in trial simulator and, and in the same time illustrate some of the very nice features that I think the platform has to offer for doing these types of simulations. I will now uh, end my demo and I think we'll open the floor up for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mark and Eddie. We invite our audience to pose your questions to Mark and Eddie in the Q&A box. You can find that box in the lower right of your screen, and please do make the panelists, the panelists to all panelists. So first question from our audience, did your clinical trial simulations take into account residual renal function that the patients may have? So uh, the, the short answer to that would be no, they did not. Uh, we, the allometric, allometrically scaled PK parameters came from a study where there was minimal residual renal function. I think only a few of them had, uh, you know, a few drops of urine. And mostly our patients were oliguric. So our simulations 
are more applicable to someone without any residual renal function, but there have been some studies that have looked at meropenem clearance in patients with significant urine output while they're on CRT, and of course the meropenem clearance is, is much greater. And uh, there's even been one study that then looked at, uh, used non-MEM, non-linear mixed effects modeling and found that if they plugged uh, the urine output in terms of mLs per hour, uh, into into the uh, non-MEM analysis that it could, it was predictive of drug distri uh, disposition. So uh, certainly there's even more challenges in someone who's making residual a lot of res has a lot of residual renal function, and it's potentially it's very well possible that an even higher dose could be needed in, in that population. Someone would like to know the patients in the youngest age group appeared to have suboptimal target attainment. Did you model higher doses in this group? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't remember that we did uh, model higher doses. Certainly 40 per kilo could, could, be, could be modeled, uh, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't report that, and I, I don't think we, we looked at that. Um, you know, that's a very unique population, and perhaps deserves a little bit more careful analysis just in the zero to one year old age group, even maybe perhaps breaking it down into zero to one month, you know, one to six months, et cetera, because there's so much maturation and change in, you know, just physiology that happens during that first year. Another thing that some people have done to increase target attainment is to lengthen the time of the infusion. So another thing that we could have done is just simulate a three hour infusion instead of a 30 minute infusion. And that generally for, for antibiotics that are dependent, where the bacterial cytal activity and efficacy is determined by the time above the MIC, that improves that because you get a, you know, a later peak three hours into the dosing interval, and that improves the, the time over the MIC. So that's another thing we could have done to potentially improve target attainment in that population. But I said, like I said earlier, it probably deserves a little more study in that unique population where they're undergoing so much maturation in so short a period of time. Looks to be our last question from the audience. Do any methods exist to predict interpatient variability in the concentration time profiles observed in the PK simulation? So there are some studies that have looked into to just that question. So there's, you know, there's a big problem in that patient A uh, might be on the same CRT as patient B, and they could be equal weight and et cetera, but yet one has markedly different clearance than the other, for example. Uh, some studies have shown that when they use a variable, and these mostly use, again, nonlinear mixed effects modeling, but when they uh, split patients into those with sepsis and those who uh, had experienced trauma, that the patients with trauma had much larger uh, volume of distribution, probably because they, they received a lot of fluids for resuscitation and they had different uh, clearance um, as it related to creatinine clearance. Uh, certainly uh, creatinine clearance, uh, residual renal function can affect that. And like I mentioned earlier, one study is used as a surrogate for that sort of uh, use the, just the renal output or the urine output, I should say, uh, is surrounding the time when they're on CRT. And of course, weight affects volume of distribution. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, there's a lot of interpatient variability, I think, that remains unexplained and, and still continues to present some challenges when trying to achieve dosing regimens that, that are adequate in, for, a, for a broad population, or for a population that can have a broad range of PK parameters. Well, so we've got another question. Were these simulations used in either IRB submittals or FDA labeling changes? Could you just say that one time, uh, one more time? Were they used in and what again? IRB? What was it? Uh, just repeat that. Uh, I didn't catch the last part. Either the, the, the submittal to the institutional review board or in the were any labeling changes on the FDA label for meropenem?
uh, did any of those label changes result um, as, as a consequence of the simulations you performed? So, so yeah, certainly we, we did, uh, you know, obtain our IRB approval uh, for for both studies as they, you know, used, well, the, the second study was enrolling real patients and the, the first study uh, would have probably qualified for de-identified data, but we, I always submit it to the IRB anyway. But as far as the label, uh, the change in the label meropenem recommendations, I don't think that it, it did. Uh, most of the time when you look in LexiComp, at least in our formulary, you know, for these patients on CRT pediatrics, it'll say limited data available and, um, and then pro provide a dosing recommendation based that, that is probably, it might not even be based on the, the label itself, but just on, on what literature there is. But to my knowledge, I, it didn't uh, result in any labeling change as far as I'm aware. Great, thank you so much, Eddie and Mark, and we'd like to thank our audience for a great discussion today.